Did you know that when you walk through a door, you start forgetting the room behind you? It's called the doorway effect and is well documented in cognitive psychology. Did you know that this is also true if it's a virtual door? As you lean forward or back, adjust your sheet, smell something from the kitchen, hear your child or your dog or another companion species, feel tired, awake, empty, you are in front of a screen. In front of your glowing monitor, your window, portal, doorway into work, play, socialization, education, the world, right now at least. As you look through your virtual doorway at my unseen face, moving lips, you are telepresent with me. Telepresence is where you are when you're talking on the phone, not quite fully in the room where you're sitting, not with the person you're speaking with, but somewhere in between. Technically, I'm both telepresent and teleabsent with you. This lecture is pre-recorded, but another me is sitting in a darkened room in a small, cold city in Yorkshire, the second story of a Victorian terraced house, child breathing steadily in the next room. I'm watching myself disgorge this talk, probably hating it, but resigned. I'm doubled in this moment. Another me is chattering on to undergraduate students about archaeological illustration. One is on YouTube telling you about a research project that never happened. One wears a skin of an elderly woman, modeled on the people of Chetelhik. Corporeal multiplicity. My wonderful, variable, digital surrogates speaking in the language of old, new media. Can you walk through this bright door with me? Hook your thumbs into the corners of your screen and stretch it around your head and forget the room behind you? Will you enter this interstitial space with me? Immerse yourself in the in-betweenness? Immersive telepresence is a productive metaphor for archaeologists. I've argued that archaeological interpretation incorporates a similar function wherein you're not completely in the present, but also not wholly in the past, but inhabit an interstitial space. I've suggested that this constitutes a cyborg archaeology that draws from feminist posthumanism to transgress bounded constructions of past people, as well as our current selves, to create a viable interstitial space where material expression from the past and present can commingle. I'm far from alone in identifying immersive, interactive environments as full of creative potential. There is, of course, Michael Shanks's extensive work on presence and experimentation with live, mediated, and simulated performance. This was also taken up by archaeologists Eric Champion and Laia Pujol-Tost, who have discussed this within the realm of digital archaeology in terms of cultural presence, a culturally meaningful interactive environment in which users could communicate and cooperate. But what happens when the immersion is incomplete, imperfect? Stuart Eve productively explored Turner's concept of breaks in presence in augmented reality. Breaks of presence are created by dissonance in perception and immersion. Eve uses this concept to understand how people experience virtual reconstructions placed within landscapes with both ancient and modern features. A power line behind a Neolithic barrow. The rupture and the interpenetration of past and present that causes hesitation and disbelief. I've been investigating interstitial spaces in archaeology, those places in between, and the digital uncanny for over a decade. I'm certain it's Ruth Tringham's fault. My beloved PhD supervisor back at Berkeley, she had the stunning foresight to team up with educational technologists to create Okapi Island, reconstructing Chatelhuyuk and Second Life. Michael Shanks intervened in this space as well with his Life Squared project with Lynn Hirschman Leeson. Second Life launched in 2003 and is still running. It is similar to massively multiplayer online role-playing games, but it is an open world where people create avatars and are able to interact with places, objects, and other avatars. We inhabited Chetelhuyuk in Second Life from 2007 to 2011. At first, the reconstruction was a flat, featureless, green square in the middle of pixelated blue water. Ruth Tringham, 
Noah Whitman, Lizzie Ha, and a group of undergraduate and graduate students at UC Berkeley terraformed the land to approximate the dimensions of the East Mound at Chatelhuyuk and placed a reconstruction of Mellart's 1960s excavation on the southwestern side. During our first open day, I placed a bonfire on the top of the tell, and after the event concluded, our avatars sat around the fire and we felt a strange sensation. Many of the avatars belonged to people who had worked at Chatelhuyuk, but were now scattered across the globe. We had sat around the actual fire with the real people behind the avatars, and now we were re virtually reenacting these earlier encounters. From these rather humble beginnings, the reconstruction was endlessly modified through our communal work. We retextured the terrain from the basic Second Life green to reflect the yellows and browns of the mound during the dry summertime, adding plants, fences, and pathways that made the mound eerily very similar to people who had seen Chatelhuyuk. The original interiors were created as a sort of museum to show images and interpretations from the site. Whereas we got more involved in room reconstructions over the years and included a reconstructed room based on material culture at Chatelhuyuk as a final project for students. We added a large swamp and the river Chashambra to the west, a source of game animals and materials to the Neolithic inhabitants of Chatelhuyuk. We added more realistic mud brick textures to the Mellot reconstruction and covered the island in snow and icicles. As many of the researchers had never actually experienced winter in Konya, and therefore most of the reconstructions, and the thinking of the archaeologists, was based on their experience of the hot days and cool nights of the Anatolian summertime. We populated the island with animals that we knew were there from the archaeological record, including owls, dogs, sheep goats, water birds, vultures, pigs, and an auroch in the swamp. While there is an ambient soundtrack of Turkish music on the island for the open day, it was replaced by a mix of sounds from sheep, pigs, cicadas, and other sounds that would have not been out of place in the Neolithic at Chetelhuyuk. Along with these additions to the reconstruction of the Neolithic era of Chetelhuyuk, we added more modern-day structures to the island. We added the sieves, and we recreated the entrance to Chetelhuyuk, complete with a dusty, dirt road, the entrance gate, and signage. Across the road was Sadatran Dural's shop, where the archaeologists get soft drinks and ice cream after work. And finally, the dig house quarters and chicken shed directly to the east of the dig house. The bonfire was moved to this location and remade entirely to appear more like the weekly bonfire that was lit on Thursday nights at Chatelhuyuk. And there was a dance floor that would animate avatars and play a few of the songs that were popular on party nights. The dig house interior was never finished, but the seminar room where I spent most of my time working was replicated, along with the terrace and the area where the tents were set up for the overflow population from the dorms. I added a water tower in the northeast corner and power lines leading to the dig house, as these figure prominently in the low skyline of the site. In this, I was recreating the most important parts of Chatelhuyuk according to my own experiences there. A bioarchaeologist would have certainly recreated the bone lab, while one of the site cooks would have perhaps recreated the kitchen and the small room at the top of the stairs where they would nap in the afternoon. The reconstruction was particularly good to think with. It brought up so many questions. When Ruth wanted to find the house containing the reconstructed room among the dozens of nondescript light brown structures, she wondered how people in the past might have distinguished between house exteriors and especially how each of the dwellings would be identified from the outside if one were unfamiliar with the community. Working closely with Carl Harrison, a forensic anthropologist specializing in the analysis of fire scenes and burning, we showed the burning sequence associated with Building 77. We are unable to animate the sequence, so we improvised. Using the four adjoining rooms on the northern side of the Mellot reconstruction, we showed the same room in four stages of burning, carefully replicating the conditions that Carl Harrison outlined regarding the intensity and duration of the blaze. Over the four years that Chatelhuyuk and Second Life ran, it was a heavily lived-in virtual reconstruction. We ran courses and student training sessions within the world, pushing the affordances of virtual media. I want to emphasize this because many virtual reconstructions of archaeological worlds are one-offs and are not modified after they are created, nor dwelt in extensively like Chatelhuyuk and Second Life. It was good to think with. It was a tool instead of a final product. 
All of these features were modified over the years, moved, improved in an ongoing process, becoming a virtual palimpsest. And it got me interested in avatars. Most of the initial participants in the creation of the island used the stock avatars provided by Second Life with little modification. These participants were primarily students with a short-term, semester-long commitment to the project. Later, when students engaged with the medium for multiple semesters, there was a shift in their avatar's appearance to a more personalized look. In most virtual archaeological reconstructions, the user is not allowed to choose their own identity or appearance. Their individual perspective is made generic, a sideline to the main attraction, which is the reconstruction itself. In Second Life, users can change gender, height, age, and ethnicity as easily as changing clothes, and many of them have several different skins that they don for different occasions. While we made Neolithic clothes based on figurines and stamp seals found at Chateau Hick, the real fun started when we tried to become Neolithic people. As noted in Nakamura's work, the process of creating Second Life avatars is extremely normative. Most female avatar shapes are thin and well-endowed, and male avatar shapes are lean and muscular. There are virtually no older avatar skins, and the children avatars are closely monitored for inappropriate behavior. After I found a shape in a skin suggesting a short, full-figured elderly woman and dressed it in our Chatelhuic Neolithic clothing, one of the bandus in a loincloth, such as suggested by the goddess figurine found by Mellart, I was shunned and denigrated by the wider non-Okapi Island Second Life community. To have the ability to be normatively and superlatively gorgeous and choose to be other than such was seen as degenerate and aberrant behavior. After playing my part in our machinima, I quickly changed back to the avatar appearance that I was more accustomed to, the avatar that I saw as reflecting me in Second Life, albeit this avatar being a thinner, more attractive, and more tattooed version of myself. Although this avatar could change quite a bit, adding skins that were impressionistic or twisted goat horns or wearing elaborate togas, I still felt there was a persistence and inner logic of selfhood that was utterly absent when wearing the shape and skin of a Neolithic mother goddess. Users of avatars in virtual worlds are more fully immersed when their bodies feel right and allow them to construct, express, and perform their identity they are seeking. Some users feel as though their avatars are truer reflections of themselves, more them than in their corporeal body. This sense of identification did not necessarily imply that the avatars looked anything like the users controlling them. Ruth Tringham's avatar had green skin, a trait she was loath to lose, even when asked to change to a more Neolithic shade for machinima. Yet, Ruth's avatar represented her in-world self so evocatively that she used the representation in other media for lectures and on her Facebook. In instances of actual and virtual co-presence, wherein users of Okapi Island were online together but also in the same room, relationships and authority were immediately reconfigured. There were students who were more competent at building or other aspects of Second Life, and we looked to them to teach us how to negotiate the virtual world. Changing clothes was also awkward, as the realistic skins that we bought for the machinima often had secondary and sometimes primary sex characteristics. I added a dressing room space to avoid awkward, naked encounters with students. The avatars became inextricably an extension of, our, of ourselves, but also obscured traditional classroom interactions. Donning the skins of Neolithic residents was extremely uncomfortable. Even in situations when we had to film during consecutive weeks, many of the students controlling the avatars cho chose to go back to their normal appearance between filming dates. I was fascinated by this interplay with virtual embodiment and the very strong reactions we all had when asked to inhabit a past person. This was an, an uncanny encounter that threatened the boundaries between us and between our ideas about the past, one the evo one the, the meh. I was fascinated by this interplay with virtual embodiment and the very strong reactions we all had when asked to inhabit a past person. This was an uncanny encounter that threatened the boundaries between us and our ideas about the past, one that evoked subversive play and startled wondrous laughter. To creatively transgress within archaeology is delightful. 
While working at Leskernick Hill, the Stone World surveyors created wooden house doorways to determine view sheds, which required people walking over to the other huts, standing on the walls, and becoming the huts themselves. Everyone was rolling around with laughter at the madness of it all. In our work on the Media Archaeology Drive project, Sarah Perry and I found the application of archaeological methods to excavate a computer hard drive the best kind of mischief, reconfiguring our research and challenging our preconceptions. Obviously, play is an underrated but deeply important part of creative digital practice in archaeology. Wearing Neolithic skins was my entry into strange digital archaeology, and much of my subsequent work has delved into a sense of weirdness or the uncanny in digital archaeology. Broader interest in our oddities may stem from the famed uncanny valley in which increased verisimilitude of near humans provokes unease in the human audience. This sense of unease is similar to that which is cultivated within some contemporary archaeology projects, when the archaeologists try to make the familiar strange through disassociation, it's shades of Victor Buckley and Gavin Lucas's absent presence, obviously. In his formative work on aura and authenticity in digital archaeology, Stuart Jeffrey describes the past as a very weird place, with profound differences between ourselves and past people. He finds the digital similarly weird, with a problematic relationship with authenticity and strange immateriality. The whirling 3D models, suspended in gray space, may lack aura altogether, or have an alternative aura. Try as we might, digital archaeologists never seem to quite fully resurrect the past, but merely a series of shambolic simulacra. This and other failure is celebrated by Sean Graham, who encourages experimentation with digital archaeology. Graham's work on productive failure within digital archaeology aims to experiment and play without punishment and improve resilience for building a better understanding during the next iteration. For digital archaeologists, failure is in a default position. To experiment with new technology and to use it in an unorthodox fashion is to fail spectacularly and repeatedly. For every seamless and very similar 3D fly-through presentation, or 2D screenshot reproduced with traditional publication, there is a vast digital graveyard of failed projects. The fragility of digital outputs within archaeology is relatively well documented, and playing with these methods leaves an astonishing wreckage of half-realized models, broken databases, and drone videos of grass and boots. It is our own vast gray literature, a strata of GIFs, broken HTML, dead iMacs with gray eyes in the corners of museums. Through failing, digital archaeology begets what I have called monsters evoking a sensuous, ambivalent in-betweenness that can be an expression of creative impulse, subversion, of evidence of play within archaeology. I'm drawing from Braidotti's monsters that represent the in-between, the mix, the ambivalent, the horrible and wonderful, object of aberration and adoration. I have used the term monster to describe synesthetic interventions into digital archaeology, but the term also invokes a sense of difference, of other. Digital interventions are Frankenstein's monsters, lurching somewhere between Tringham's faceless blobs and an idealized ontological collective, networked and multifaceted, but still oddly homogenous. Archaeological monsters are human and unhuman aggregate, one that digital archaeologists should recognize as we practice assembling, as Haraway states, articulations among cosmos, animal, human, machine, and landscape in their recursive, sidereal, bony, electronic, and geological skeletons. This brings me to the latest iteration of this research, the Other Eyes Project. I was inspired by this quote from Proust, the only true voyage of discovery, the only fountain of eternal youth, would be not to visit strange lands, but to possess other eyes, to behold the universe through the eyes of another, of a hundred others, to behold the hundred universes that each of them beholds. The experiences I had while running around as a Neolithic person in Second Life were singular, fascinating, and unsettling, but there was very little verisimilitude. 
The avatars we designed were based on somewhat vague notions of what people may have looked like. Indeed, these decisions were part of the learning process. As I previously mentioned, investigating archaeological data for reconstructions is one of the best ways to query the record. The omissions and the failures in thinking are immediately apparent, but they did not reflect any particular person, but a range of experiences and people who inhabited Chetelhoyev, possibly. During my postdoc working with the Eurotest project, a Marie Curie initial training network, I found archaeologists investigating individuals to a high level of detail through examining skeletal remains, ancient DNA, and isotopic analyses. Bioarchaeological life histories are increasingly common, but have rarely been translated to digital archaeology. Several years after I initially became interested in this concept, I received funding from the Arts and Humanities Research Council in the UK for the Other Eyes project. The Other Eyes project aims to better understand and transmit the experiences of past people using virtual embodiment and immersive technologies. We draw from bioarchaeological life histories to create avatars based on Roman era skeletons excavated in York. These human remains have shown that many past people experienced altered mobility, whereas reconstructions privilege a normative, able-bodied perspective. By creating avatars from bioarchaeological evidence, we aim to fundamentally alter how academics and the general public understand and interpret the past. We seek to understand the history, context, and ethics of reconstructing past people from a multicultural viewpoint and explore the capacity for these reconstructions to evoke empathetic re responses from present people. With project partners Beatty Jester and the Orchestra Museum and Stuart Eve, we will explore the use of avatars within a mixed reality setting and encourage engagement from audiences who may not otherwise engage with archaeological research. The project has a start date of the 1st of January, so watch this space. Through this discussion, I hope I have encouraged you to show off your digital monsters. I hope that there will always be room for multisensorial interpretations that compromise boundaries, for playful failure, and non-technonormative projects that threaten traditional understanding of the past. Thank you.